I would entertain a motion to accept the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Seconded. All in favor? All right. Aye. 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 As uh, normally our custom, we will open up the floor to public comment or inquiry related to items not on the published agenda. Yes, Ellie. I just want to update or make sure that I have the approval um, that Thatcher Henman is um, is now a member of the Re uh, Recreation Committee. So he should submit a letter of interest to, uh, okay. to the select board so that we can see okay. his interest and we can review and appoint uh, him. So as Ellie is appointed by the select board, and it's great if you have his interest, you should share that with us. Okay, thank you. In a written letter or email would be great. <laughs> Any other public comment or inquiry? So hearing none, we will, um, we had a set an agenda for 6.15, start our discussion about the budget. We have a regular meeting to hold after that. I don't want to necessarily cut out anybody from the public that would attend at 6.15. So uh, does the board feel like you would like to move on to some of our other items like the town manager's report? and start our, our public information meeting at 6.15, or do you want to just jump into it? Uh, I'm okay with moving moving forward. There's a few faces that I don't see here yet that I would think would be here. So. Mary? Mary Floyd. What? Are you? Oh, you, sorry. not moving her forward. Yeah, do you, do you think you have less than 10 minutes of discussion? Yeah. All right, so then let's hear our, uh, let's go from our appointment. Do you need anybody from your committee? I'm sorry, Mary, I just, we're shuffling things around to make sure that we have enough public in interest. Do you need any of your committee members to be here? All right. All right, then. All right, so we'll, we'll hear Mary's interest and move her appointment forward to now. Okay, uh, I'm seeking um, approval the select board to allow a committee to be formed to further explore possible options for the building pro property. And there's a reason why you don't, why the Conservation Commission wouldn't follow that? Too? Well, the Conservation Commission is definitely interested. Um, as one of your statutory authorities, you have the ability, the ability to evaluate conservation properties out there to take action on those on behalf of the town. Right. There are some other parties um, which are interested too. We've talked to the White River Conservancy, <coughs> Steve yeah. Libby. Yeah. Um, they have resources to help with that. Uh, and also uh, White River Partnership, yeah. Mary Ross. So I would like them to be members of the committee. I don't know how many people we want on it, but it seems like maybe well, or so, five is more. Um, I don't think that the board doesn't have any problem with exploring the possibilities of conserving that property. Um, I'm just concerned uh, to uh, be redundant. You know, um, there's no reason I think that the Conservation Commission doesn't, I think they have authority to uh, yes. uh, interact with other organizations, particularly those that could be fund help assisting in funding um, such a project. I, I guess I'm not exactly sure why it would be in the purview of the Conservation Commission to just move ahead with this it's and partner more, with it's them. It's uh, also a, uh, the purpose of requesting this is so that you, as a select board, are aware of our interest and what we're interested in doing. Yeah, yeah. And as much as anything. I'm just not sure that we need to uh, appoint another committee. I think that we could say, yeah, go ahead, work with those organizations and let us know so what the end result is. I think part of the idea here was that she wanted to pursue the, the property and funding and, and the cost from the current owner. And the Conservation Commission and the current owner haven't got a real great relationship. Yeah, well, that, that could be resolved. I mean, you have, absolutely, you have state legislative statutory authority to take on this action. 
it, you don't need the select board to um, review your interest in conservation of property. And to ask these other groups to join us, that's well, that's yeah, I mean, they, they aren't going to join you. They aren't going to join us anyway. They're standalone organizations. You can, they can join in the effort, and they can, and they can whatever funding scheme and, and formula ends up being the result that, that potentially purchases the property. I think that that is entirely legal without us bringing them in as part of the committee. I believe sure that under the statutes, you can formulate your own subcommittees in, in, in there to do other work in the prospect of every Are you, um, so I mean, I guess picking up on what Greg was saying, you're looking for the select board to try to facilitate that kind of? No, right. no we're just looking for um, your awareness, yeah. your approval, um, your these other organizations, for example, the River Conservancy, yeah. has the, have the um, structure yeah. to do such things as um, conduct an appraisal. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're interested in having them do. They have a lot of experience with that. They yeah. do it on a regular basis, yeah. which we do not. Right. So I absolutely think we can tap into them clearly. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you say? I think you can tap into that resource clearly. That would be yes, we've already had a discussion. Yeah. Yeah, well, I made that connection almost a year ago. I mean, that's pretty quickly, so I'm not, I'm not 100% behind it. So we just need to move, move forward, forward as we are? Yeah. Okay. But I think it's great that you've updated us. I think it makes a lot of sense for the town. It'd be great to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the things that's confusing, you know, the Conservation Commission is a town committee as if it's a subcommittee of the, of the town, and, and it is, but it's been actually let, given enabling legislation from the state of Vermont to, perf to perform certain duties in conservation in the, in the interest of the town so that it's not, your actions are not interfered by the political fickleness of a select board. You, you actually have authority. And I would say that that would be an important, this is exactly the kind of example of a project that, that fits into that category. So you'd move forward with this um, on, in the best interest of the community. So we're getting a pretty good crowd. Um, still is only 10, well, thank you very much, Mary. You're I want to give them another five minutes to get here and we can hear the town manager report. All right, so everybody that's come in, we're, we're just moving ahead with our normal scheduled uh, agenda because we uh, arranged to start the information meeting at 6.15 and we want to wait to make sure that everybody um, who wants to be here at the beginning is here. So we've got five more minutes. We're going to move ahead to the next agenda item, which is our town manager's report. Alright, so my report is in your packet. Um, a couple of the highlights here, uh, I've been, so we uh, applied for a grant oh, about a year ago for the painting of the steeple on Town Hall. Yeah. Or, or here, you know, and, uh, so we went out to bid, uh, Keith had gone out to bid before I'd started and we got only one bid back and it was pretty high. So um, I've been exploring other options and I think I've finally got a, a local painter out of uh, Randolph, I believe. Um, who's bid on it, and it's, it's going to be within budget, to be below budget, actually. And we'll not only get the, the lower part, but we'll get the top part also. Um, so um, I'm putting together, or they're putting together all their credentials and their insurance and all that so we can send it to the state and, make, and have them approve it. Uh, if they approve it, then we'll go forward with it, and we should be able to get, the, get this done summertime. Uh, so that's exciting. Yeah. We found out that it's not lead paint that's on there. It's, it was the other paint that was used before, and it has failed. So... Um, they're using the same material that we had, uh, we had called, or Keith had called Benjamin Moore Paints and gotten a recommendation on what to use, and this painter said that's exactly what I would have used. So, as long as they meet all the, the state's requirements, uh, you know, for, for historic, for historic uh, they've told me that they've done projects um, at the local colleges, 
they do some historic buildings at the local colleges. So yeah. as soon as I get there, what's that? I'm familiar with them. Are you? Yeah. yeah. So we'll see if they come back and are qualified, we'll move forward with them and they'll, they'll get that done. So that's exciting. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as far as the utility department, you know, we're just kind of moving forward. We're, um, I will be having a meeting uh, on the 28th. Myself and our engineers and, and Tim Mills will be having a meeting with, uh, with Aldridge and Elliott to start the water master plan. Uh, this is that document that, if you remember, we'll put together that tells us you know, where our, our system's at, where our system's going, what sorts of capital improvements we need to look at, rate structures, all that. So we have a kickoff meeting with our engineers on the 28th to, to start that whole, whole plan. So. Um, Bridge 33, we, uh, I'm actually working on another grant, the next year's structures grant. Uh, if you remember this grant was, um, we'd originally gotten a grant for this for the entire project, engineering and design and construction, and the engineering came in more than we thought it would. So I talked with the state and they said, why don't you just reduce the first grant down to engineering costs only and then get that engineered and then we'll go out to bid next year and, with a new grant. So we're, I'm applying for that. We should get that. Shouldn't be a big problem to get that. And we'll be able to get next summer, uh, hoping to get bridge number 33 fixed. Uh, and then for anybody that doesn't know, that's the high bridge in Lilliesville. Yeah, and it was, it, it's been categorized or it's been, I think it was two years ago, it was inspected and they found that the footing was undermined and it had some structural issues. So this is a, a grant to repair that bridge. Um, Unfortunately, it'll mean it'll have to be that road will have to be closed for probably a week or two, but we'll we'll get that all figured out as we get there. Um, let's see. Let's get going. Uh, the the property that we were just talking about, the Villa Duke property. Um, so there was a proposal that went to the uh, the DRB uh, about a fourplex, I believe it was. Uh, that was that that they didn't pass. Um, so he is going to be appealing that decision uh, in in environmental court. So I've got the paperwork on that, but it's just kind of an FYI on that. Okay. Um, other than that, I, I, I don't really have anything else. Um, there's some other things I want to discuss later on, but as far as kind of the operations and how things are going, we're, we're just trying to keep up, to keep up with mud now. That seems Great. to be the issue of the day. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, well, that's a good start. It's filled in the gap. It's 13 minutes after six, which is, yes, Mary. Yeah, I ask a question about that last point. Um, when I remember that there was a discussion after the appeal of Dollar General's uh, proposed proposal, that, which was denied at the local level. And uh, what was learned is that the town of Bethel didn't have some, I don't want to minimize it, but didn't have some special designation or paperwork in the state. Has that been done? The administrative procedure. Right. Administrative procedure is What are people in? Did you want to speak to that? And so has it been done? <coughs> Well, the reason why the second one wasn't done that way is because it ar had already started. Yes, um, but, but, but I'm asking really in light of this one, this appeal. Oh, he's saying that it was not followed in this either because it had already been started. He had already put his, he had already filed the, the permit prior and it, it had been begun without using administrative procedures. Right, it goes back to the yeah. So it's the same, it, it's under the same but, standing. But we are working towards moving to that and having you know having everybody swear in as, as a and we also do have interested. i mean we have full transcripts of the proceedings so anybody who did testify whose testimony was um, pertinent to the decision of the drb will be um, given an opportunity to speak to to that as a um, interested party can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. There was a question last time about interested parties. Um, do those people who already spoke, are they able to speak through the town rather than make themselves become interested persons? I don't think that's right. You have to testify directly. If, if the hearing goes forward, you have to present yourself because the, this hearing will be, will follow administrative procedures. Uh -huh. In other words, each person who speak, if, they're, if what they say is to be considered evidence, it has to be presented in person. As an interested person? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's. They will not be allowed to speak through the town's lawyer. No, that was a question no. Last time. 
No, these have to be. They have to be witnesses. You have to be. You have to testify as a as a quote unquote expert. All right. Any other questions? Because I would like to start the budget information meeting. Great. Thank you. All right. So um, this has been a discussion in the board for quite some time, and I'm really happy to see so many people out tonight. I'm going to turn the meeting over to Chris Jarvis, who's taking our lead on this, and um, he'll lead you through it tonight. And I'll take you through the, uh, I kind of divide it up into three parts tonight. So the first part I just want to, we'll go through is kind of the board, where we're at, where we're going. Um, and, and the second part would be getting into the budget itself. And the third part um, would be getting into the line of credit or the deficit that we've heard about. So, um, Therese, at any time, if you, you need to jump in, let me know. Um, the only thing I'd like to do is just um, hold questions towards until the end. Um, because my guess is probably going through this, some questions will be answered ahead of time. Um, we'll be able to flow this through. It's not, if this was a meeting just for the budget itself, we'd probably have a lot of time to do it, but being that it's an a hour slotted, I think, um, we'd like to try to keep the meeting prompt um, and do the questions toward the end. So, But definitely, <laughs> at the end, we'll have enough time, uh, hopefully, for everybody to answer any questions. Um, so, I, you know, kind of looking through this, I mean, this was um, two years ago, well, will be two years ago next week, is, you know, kind of the reason why I got on the board. Um, you know, I, not to speak for my colleagues that are on the board, but, you know, some of the reasons why I got on the board was, you know, I didn't think that the town was moving in a positive direction. Um, I didn't think that the, the budgets that had been um, handed out in the past uh, were accurate. I also didn't believe that the town's people's money was being spent efficiently. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure my colleagues on the board here probably had, you know, some of those um, same thoughts when they had run as well. Um, so just, you know, I, I've been on the board for two years, um, which I, I think I'm the second in the rankings, <laughs> five people in two years. Um, but, um, you know, a lot has happened in one year here. Uh, the last year, this board um, has, has done a lot for the town. Um, so a, a few points I just wanted to bring up on that is, you know, we have identified as a board that our budgets are not accurate for the services that we have been providing or the services that our taxpayers want provided for them. Um, and we identified that last year during our budgeting um, part and we're making those steps. Last year we went in a three, three cent increase as well as this year was our goal was to do a three cent increase. And I'll show you that here coming forward. The, um, the other thing was, you know, the taxpayer's money, you know, my money, their money, was not being spent efficiently to do work. Um, you know, either we had money that was being contracted out, that was being done subpar, that we could have been doing in-house or, or other things. Um, and, and the other one that's starting to rear its head is, you know, our budgets have been burdened by uncollected revenues from the town. Um, and, and I'll get into that in a moment, which is, you know, monies that are owed through utility and taxes. Um, so the board here over the last year, um, well, two years now on budget, this is the second budget that kind of most of us have been a part of, we have been constructing realistic budgets. Realistic budget in the past, uh, you know, was and you can see it, um, you can go through your town meeting uh, handouts, booklets every year, you can clearly see, and this is the points I used to make, is if you have a line item that costs you $10,000 every year, but you only budget $5,000 every year, you're going over budget, you're not within your budget. Um, so we, we put together a realistic budget for the town. Um, we, uh, we also spent a significant amount of time this past year, a lot of time this past year, on reorgan reorganizing the administration and getting it to perform in an efficient manner. So that for every dollar that we put in as tax money, hopefully we're getting a dollar ten back or two dollars back. 
or something. I mean, I, don't, I really don't believe in the past that we were getting, you know, a dollar back for a dollar or, or more than that. Um, so some of that was done with, with Greg being hired as the town um, manager. Um, we spent a lot of ex time um, going through that and finding the right candidate, which we believe we have. Um, that came with opening the new position of the finance manager through Therese. And as you can clearly see, uh, a finance manager was, was something that the town needed in the past, not just a, an assistant to a town manager. You know, we needed somebody that had uh, financial experience that can, can audit the books and make sure that we were what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, we've had now for a couple of years now, we've had a full-time bookkeeper. Doesn't sound like a lot, but there was many years we didn't have a bookkeeper. Um, the audits are being done on time every year. Um, you know, these are things that you would expect to be done, but there was a three-year period uh, in the 2012 ish area where there was no audits done for three years. Um, there was a high, uh, we hired a new road foreman, um, as well as a new uh, crew person for the town. So we're, you know, we think that we've got our team in place um, to go back to these going forward. And, and the last maybe five months since Teresa's been on, we've, we've had an aggressive um, enforcement of collecting our past revenues that are due for the town. Um, and these were things that we've had policies in place for years, they just were not enforced. So, can I just, yeah. So, along those lines, one of the things that this board has been working on for five years is um, job descriptions, performance evaluation, and professional development. And that had never been done prior to 2013. So, um, what Chris just described in terms of the last year and a half of, of administrative change and performance uh, is a direct result of that. And we're, we're looking forward to uh, seeing that continue to improve moving forward. Uh, and, and the other thing that we're getting now that we never had in the past is we're getting monthly um, or sometimes twice a month, uh, we're getting cost reports broken down by the departments so that we can see where we're at and we can make adjustments as we're going. And believe it or not, the department heads are actually getting those now. And you would think that a department head would get their cost reports, but that was never done in the past. So, I mean, these are, these are some of the steps that we've taken to, to get an efficient administration in this town. The, um, the budget first, we'll just kind of talk about an overview on the budget. Um, the proposed budget for the town is, is $2,360,000. $121, the, uh, and then once you deduct out um, revenues uh, raised other than taxes, um, the amount to be raised by taxes would be $1,943,517, which is in the morning. Uh, one thing to take note, um, a lot of these figures, uh, when you're talking by you know, cent increase for your taxes or dependent on what the grand list is. Our grand list actually went down a little bit this past year, so we took a little bit of a hit there. It wasn't a big one, but a little bit of a hit there. So that's something to think of. Um, so what I like to do a lot, um, you know, I've worked with budgets for a long time, and I always like to try to compare apples to apples to something, because that's the only way I can really see, you know, where, where do we stand this year versus last year? Or, um, so, what I've done is I, I to kind of get down to the apples to apples comparison of how much is our budget really going up um, is I take out all the extras and what I mean by the extras is the is is the the items that we will be voting in on top of the budget during town meeting so that would be a human services um, piece of twenty three thousand two fifty White River Valley ambulance of one hundred twenty seven thousand eight ninety uh, we have two fire department uh, pieces. One is for um, fire department maintenance for the building, which is 10,000. And the other one is the fire hydrant schedule, which is 5,500. And then the last piece is the line of credit piece, which is 100,000 <coughs> minus six. So those, those items, those five items there equal $267,546. So if you subtract that number from from the amount to be raised by taxes, that gives us what I call the town's operating budget 
of $1.675 million. So um, that's what our operating budget would be for um, starting in July of, next, July of this year. To compare apples to apples on that, last year's budget was $1.617 million. So our budget has gone up, our operating budget has gone up by $58,600, which is three cents. So, and I can tell you that when we started, it wasn't three cents, it was five, six cents. And, you know, we've looked through line item after line item to figure out, you know, when we, when we spend anything, you know, what is gonna be the most efficient or our best bang for our buck on, on all these items. So just kind of compare that, we, we're at, a, our operating budget has gone up by three cents versus last year. <laughs> last year's operating budget went, went up by three cents over the year prior. So uh, just to kind of take that, uh, put that in perspective. Out of the $58,000 that our budget has increased over last year, just benefits alone for our <coughs> town workers. So the benefit piece was $82,000, okay? So our, our total budget went up $58,000, but our benefits went up $82,000, which is- Health insurance. Health insurance. Now, Maybe. to kind of, to break that down a little bit, um, Therese and, and Greg did a good job of, well, we went out and found another health care provider um, that provides um, just as equal health care as we had before, um, and we were able to absorb some of the increases. So when you're, when you're talking about the health care, if, if you go through Blue Cross or, or one of those, they set their rates based on calendar year. So they'll say 12% increase for the 2018 calendar year. However, our operating costs start in July. So we have to take six months of the operating year to figure out what, what our increase is gonna be in healthcare. So what we had done is we had switched carriers and we were able to not have to take that 10 or 12% hit for the first six months of this next operating budget. However, on the back end six months of the budget for 2019, we have to build in some sort of premium increases that will happen, so, so we've done that. Um, so 82,000, now I will tell you out of the 82,000, if we break it down, a smaller amount of that 82,000 is actual increase in someone's health care. You know, the health care is probably gonna go up about, once you factor in everything, it's probably gonna go up five or six percent. The, the biggest pieces that happen is an example of, let's say you have somebody that works for the town and they don't, they don't take the town uh, health care. And say they leave and we have to fill that position. And if we fill that position and then the person that comes in takes the health care, but not only takes the health care, but probably has you know, a family plan, right? That could be a huge swing. That could be a thirty dollars or $40,000 swing just by one person, um, you know, coming in with benefits versus non-benefits. And, and that's kind of what we saw this year. We've had, like we just talked about, we had a lot of positions that we just filled. And some positions, we feel we've filled all these positions to be to the benefit of the taxpayer. However, um, you know, some of the workers have, you know, adopt, you know, have elected to take health care where some in the past might not have. Um, so that was a challenge. But, you know, we did have $82,000 in increases and we, we put $58,000 of it forward as an increase to the taxpayers as a whole. Um, the other thing that we, that we added in, it's not big, but a lot of our items really didn't change a whole lot. We moved some things, we took some hired services that we're gonna start doing ourselves. Um, we shuffled some things around. We added some more into legal. Um, legal is one of those things when we're talking about why is it operating budget overrun every year. It's because if you go back every year, we budget $10,000 for a lawyer to go fight something for us, right? And if you go back and look on that, every year we're spending thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to fight legal battles. And, and the other thing, you know, we, 
we have to protect ourselves, so we need some sort of realistic budget on, on lethal. I will say that just about every case since I've been on the board that has been legal that we've fought, we've won, but it's cost us a lot of money to do that, um, to protect our town. Um, so just kind of a little bit of the breakdown on the budget there. So we have the three cents, that's the operating budget, uh, increase over last year, if we're talking increases. Um, there's three tenths of a cent increase in the White River Valley Ambulance over last year. Uh, I will say that that's a pretty modest increase because that's the first real increase we've had from them in five years. So it wasn't uh, really too big. The human services uh, increase is two tenths of a cent on our tax rate. Um, what we had found out, um, just kind of short story, um, is you know for so many years, Taxpayers in the town have been using these services more and more every year, but we have not been paying our fair share. Um, every year, if you go back and look through it, it's level funded at the same amounts it was the year prior to the year prior to that. And our ridership or, or our um, uh, applicants to go to these services have increased drastically. So we have to make that adjustment. Um, and then if you add in the two items for the fire department, that adds up another eight tenths of a cent. Uh, increase over last year's budget. And then the, the largest increase would be 5.1 cent increase, which is the, the line of credit um, to be retired. So that kind of opens us up to, let's talk about the line of credit, right? So the, the published amount on the line of credit uh, that we have seen is, or, or that we have all seen is 1.725 million. That was the, the amount that was published. Um, we believe, and working through Therese, feel free to jump in, um, we're still owed some monies um, from the state. And once, once the rest of that money comes in, we're gonna be somewhere in the 1.2 to 1.3 million dollar um, So kinda, Myself, again, trying to figure out, well, okay, so we're at 1.2 and change million. Where, where did that money go, right? I mean, that's my question I would have if I was sitting in your seats, which I have in the past said. <laughs> so the, the first piece I start doing is taking away what I know, right? So the first is, let's look at the revenues that are due to the town. And, and this, and this, when I go through this, I'm going to try to break it up. Obviously, I can't tell you where every single penny or every dollar went to, but I, I have Therese and I and, and Greg have kind of looked through to see where we believe things were at. Um, the, and this is over almost a 10 year period. So revenues that are due as of today, there's still $322,000 that's due for taxes that haven't been collected. And property, there's property tax. Property tax. There's also $145,000 in utility fees that have not been collected. So right away you have $467,000 that what I like to do is deduct that off that 1.2 that we just heard about, right? Because I'm trying to dwindle that down to figure out what, where this money went. Uh, the, next, the next big item that comes up on, on the last 10 years is we had the flood event of 2007. You know, we had Camp Brook Road that took s substantial hit at that point, and there were some other areas in town that, that got hit really hard. The problem that you have when you have those localized flooding events is we don't, we don't get re reimbursed at the rate like we would when we had the Irene event. Um, Estimated from looking back between the that flood event, not only what it cost us to have contractors to come in to fix these areas, but also it also cost our public works more money to do some of the smaller areas that we did ourselves. There was about four hundred thousand dollars that was taken out as line of credit to do this work. Irene, when I got on the board, I kept I asked, you know. Carl Contesto, I've asked, I don't know, 20 times probably in the last two years, 
of what the number is for irene what's the number for irene you know i'm thinking you know carl and i used to think it was probably six or seven hundred thousand dollars that irene cost us right it's a big number we were all told it was going to be a big number right we did overall irene um, we did six million dollars worth of infrastructure I won't say improvements infrastructure replacements and in some cases were improvements um, i mean fema pays basically if you have a 12 inch pipe put a 12 inch pipe back in it, right um, but you got to think if it was a 20 year old pipe and now you put a new pipe in there is some sort of improvement there uh, the, so the town did six million dollars worth of infrastructure from from irene we also just to mix it in at that point we had gone ahead with our recreation program plan that one of the steps was to do the pool and the pool house was part of our steps one thing that we were able to get done through an alternative fema project was to reconstruct the pool house which was done so so the wreck building with all the irene damage the total amount burden on the town was 58, uh, 57,000 and change. So out of $6 million, 57,000 and change is, is our obligation for Irene. That's based upon the governor coming out and saying that the most that a town's burden would be a three cent. So that's what the town of Bethel has a burden for Irene only. So once we're, we're so we're taking all these away from that 1.2 million dollar number that I had I said earlier. So at the end it comes down to what I call subtotal 370 thousand dollars. Where'd that money go, right? So that's where I'm left at the bottom. 370 thousand. Where'd it go? Don't know. I can't tell you. I can't tell you where all those pennies went. What I can tell you is coincidentally. I had 10 years worth of um, town meeting annual reports at home. So I just started skimming through them and looking at it and just kind of looking at line items. And you can see that what we were budgeting and what our actual numbers were not lining up. Now, it, it doesn't, you know, it sounds like a lot of money, $373,000 left over, but over a 10 year period, that's $37,000 $37, a year of not, you know, over budgeting or under budgeting. Um, and, and some of those things can be, just like we talked about, it could be legal. It can be all these things that we don't see coming that happen. <clears throat> the, the other thing I wanted to add was we went back as far as 2007. Is that correct, Therese? Yeah. So 2007 to now 2018 is the time frame that we being able to look through to see where money went. Um, <clears throat> so we had, if, if you look at, there was a handout that was passed out, out back table. Um, it kind of breaks down by the year. It's called financial overview, 2007 yeah. to 2016. So don't, don't necessarily read into the number exactly because that's just a snapshot in time at that, that period when we're we're trying to compare them. But what it will show you is you can see a trend of where the negatives were growing larger than, you know, there's no positives, right? And also there's a list of lines of credit. Yeah. There's a, a habitual practice of maintaining a line of credit for deficit spending. So from kind of looking through this, the, the first kind of line of credits that you start to see is, is the $400,000 that was taken out and it was taken out during the flood of 07 to do that. <clears throat> and then, and then you kind of look, um, so you have, you have the line of credit was taken out to do some of that flood repair work. Again, you're going back and you're looking at these budgets that were crafted that weren't necessarily, uh, managed correctly in a way. Um, and then we had a three-year period in around the 2012 area. We had a three-year period where we didn't even have an audited budget. You know, we went three years without an audit in this town. 
and I don't want to use the word perfect storm, but in around that same time that we didn't have a three-year audit, Irene smacked us, and when Irene hit us, we had to take out a massive amount of line of credit to pay for these infrastructure rebuildings. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, kind of, I wasn't here at that point, but, I, you know, I, I think what's happened is there, there's a lot of mismanagement of, of the line of credit at that point. And um, there was a lot of, a lot of FEMA uh, projects going on. You know, there, I, I don't know how many we had at one given time, but it was probably too much for one person to, to sit there and manage. You know, maybe hindsight what it is. Maybe what we should have done as a town is hired, hired a part-time person to just do the FEMA stuff. Because all I've heard since, you know, since um, Irene is, well, we don't really know exactly where we're at for FEMA. Well, probably should have, right? Yeah, that was the, that was the answer that we all got as of and, as of and, and the other thing over this 10-year period is we had an increase of people not paying either their taxes, their property taxes, or their utility um, fees. So all this kind of comes together, and now you have a you know, a line of credit that's due that hasn't been retired as long-term debt that's still short-term debt that we have. So, um, so the amount that we're gonna end up retiring is in the 1.2 and change area. Um, and the amount that we'll have to pay back this year is about $100,000 towards that. Um, now, just keep in mind that 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 won't be $100,000 each year because we also have to pay this year. What's included in that $100,000 is the, is the interest payment that's due on the short-term loan that we have out currently. So we're going to be paying a short-term loan interest payment to the bank this year plus, plus the long-term <coughs> retirement um, piece. So next year that $100,000 might be seventy-seven and change or something like that. To, to retire this. I can open up to questions. Um, I'll, I'll write them down and uh, if, if for some reason we can't answer them, if they're, if they're really a, if they're a macro level question, it'll probably be pretty easier to answer them. If they're more micro level, um, Teresa and I, we can write them down, we can research them. Um, you know, I will say one thing that this board has tried to do and you've probably seen is, is to be very transparent. Um, we provide a lot of information out to um, the taxpayers uh, to see pretty much anything that we see for the most part now. I know in the past that wasn't always the case. So. Yes, Mary. Can you elaborate a little bit, Chris, on what or what you all think that term mismanagement of the line of credit translates to in a day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month payment of bills? Would it be that, you know, a contractor says it's going to take us 50000 you know, we bid $50,000 to fix this stretch of road. Does that mean that they double their fee and, and the town never looked at it closely and just paid the bill? Like what, what is encompassed in that word mismanagement to you? Well, I, I think that's a... Um, Yeah, it, it's not a simple question to answer, but what, what I'll, I'll tell you is it goes a couple of different ways. So I think there were, like we talked about in the past, that we're not what I would say accurate budgets. So if you, if every year your, your line, if, look, I'm whatever line item, if you have a line item every year, something that you do every single year, but every single year it's over what you budgeted. Wouldn't you think that the next year that maybe you would budget a little bit more for it, right? And you can go back and you can look through the annual reports where if there's an item that kept running over running, they kept using the same budgeted amount for the next year, right? I mean, if every year it costs us $50,000 in attorney fees, then don't you think we should budget $50,000? No, we'll budget the 10000 thinking that, you know, we got a rosy covered glasses on and things are going to be good that year. And, and that wasn't it. I mean, so there was no realistic, what we call realistic <coughs> budgets for the last 10 years. We're, we're trying to get to there. 
Um, there, the line of credits, I would say, weren't necessarily managed as efficiently as they should have been. And line of credits are very difficult to manage because you have to take the town to operate has to take line of credits out for various different things. Um, you know, there's a certain time every single year that we have to pay the school even if we don't have the money, right, Teresa? So mm -hmm. you take a line of credit out maybe in quarter two because you have to pay the school their 100% money for the year. Now, at that point in time, the town's only collected maybe a quarter of its taxes for the year. So you have to take a line item out on that. Um, other cases can be, you know, you, you take a line, uh, line of credit out for a project, right, like you were just talking about. And, you know, maybe that project was a $30,000 project that turned into $38,000. Now, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily seem like a lot of money. It, it, it ran over by $8,000 and our budget's $2 million, right? So it doesn't seem like a lot of money, but it's kind of like that thing, you know, your household budgets, right? If every day you go down to the store and you buy yourself a coffee in the morning, and it's only $2, right? But if you buy it every single day, that adds up. And I think there was so many of these little overages in the budget that added up over time that weren't being corrected. And I'd like to expand on that since I have been on the board since 2015. And some of the, the quote, of, we're using mismanagement in a term, in, in, a, in a sort of a factual way. We're, we're not meaning that this is, it's not a derogatory use of the term. Um, but there are several different lines of credit building at different times all together. And there were a variety of different deficits. Uh, the uncollected sewer fees, um, sewer and water, um, also some capital projects in, the, in those systems that needed to be funded out of the general fund. There's the overrunning budgets like Chris was talking about. There's the, the desire of managers people in the administration and the boards to present budgets to the people that are palatable and the desire to actually adhere to those budgets as throughout the operating year, yet there are demands for services throughout the year that, that are legitimate. And so there may have been, um, and I know there was, and because this is what I've been dealing with for since I've been on the board is trying to get some clarity about how we can maintain discipline around the expenditures. And there hasn't been, you know, um, there hasn't been since I, actually before I even sat down the year that I was elected, I asked the town manager at town meeting what, what the scope of this, particularly at the time, it was the, we call the Irene debt, what that scope actually was gonna be for the town because we needed to know what we were gonna come and do. And, there was genuinely never a clear answer. The, the management, all of the management that has been in, in place has been, as far as I can see, working as hard as they could to come up genuinely with numbers that they could give us so that we could have a clear picture on that. And we weren't getting it. Um, I think that, that uh, that's what I'm thinking. That's why we're calling it mismanagement. It's just that it was not managed <laughs> accurately or clearly or for proficiency, proficiently. And, um, and that's why I keep coming back to what I said before about the um, professional development in our staff because um, as, a, as a volunteer select board, we're actually dependent upon the professional staff that we hire. Um, you know, some of us are, can, uh, and we do need to dig down into these things, but if, if we can't, if we don't have access to the inner workings of the finances because of the uh, capability or the um, challenges that our management is experiencing, then the only recourse we have is to work toward improving that professional de delivery of services. And um, so <clears throat> coinciding with the building of this deficit has been this growth that we've made toward management that can actually provide this detailed information to us. So, um, um, sorry, that's what I see as mismanagement. Um, 
Um, just a minute, I, Joanne had, oh, she, Ellie, go ahead. Um, uh, am I remembering correctly um, that when you were talking about the figures, did we overpay, or the school, wasn't there a year that we um, paid twice? Paid twice to the school? And then Is we that part of the figures? We took that money back, yeah. oh. penny for penny. Oh, okay. That's why oh, that's I, why the school ended up in their deficit. Oh, because <laughs> I I do I thought I remembered. Yeah, Joanne. Um, oh, and we are taping this, so if people could say your name. Oh, I'm sorry, Ellie. Yeah. Uh, Joanne Wood, I want to ask about the audits. Um, so you had mentioned, Chris. You know, now the audits are done on time. What? What do you mean by done on time? What is a reasonable amount of time from the end of the fiscal year for getting that final audit report from your auditors? Sure. Oh, Therese, you might answer you that should, one. Normally, you should have it by now. Normally, um, you Six would months. have the auditor would come in, you know, in June mm -hmm. before you close the finance fiscal year ends, and then they would come back again, possibly in October. And but generally, you have it published right about right after town meeting, usually it does come out about March. And right now, I'm still waiting for the draft. I haven't seen it yet, but I am speak okay. conversed so, on a regular basis. So, so, uh, so we're, when, uh, very disconcerting to hear that there was a period of three years without an audit. So how, how are we going to ensure that we're having audits done yearly and that they're done timely and that the results of the audit are being looked at and understood by both the management and the select board. What is the process that's going to be put in place to ensure that that happens going forward and not dependent upon who is sitting in a particular position? Uh, unfortunately, it has a lot to do with who's in position. Well, I th so I think, again, you know, I, I know that there's, you know, I know that there's a, a reason for not kind of looking back and trying to pick apart like how did this all happen? Well, but it you. is important to identify the systems that failed us in the past. So, and so I'm trying to say, if it if you're saying to me that it is kind of dependent on who's sitting there, we need to make it independent of who's sitting in the position. Well, Therese may have some ideas. And, the, and just before Therese answers that question, but that goes back to you know the board and you know one of the one of the things that we had identified, uh, which when, when Greg came in as a town manager, he had identified as well, is what we thought, we changed the organization structure a little bit of the town when we went through here. And, um, you know, instead of having an assisted town manager, we decided that, you know, we had this in our mind. Greg came, and after Greg had a little bit of time here, a month or so, he had said, hey, this is what we need. And this is the same thing we're thinking is, we, we need somebody that is going to have their hands on the financials at all times. So, you know, not to put Therese on the, on the spot, but you need to have somebody, a finance manager, director, you know, we tried all these different words, what, what we were going to name it, but we need somebody full-time looking at the financials. And that's not just looking at the financials, looking at, you know, your operating budget, where you're at currently, making sure that your audits are getting done in a timely fashion, but it's also collecting your taxes and collecting fees. So Therese is, is, our, is our person. Um, so would it be fair to say then that part of the job description for the finance manager would be to, um, is to make sure that an audit is done every year and is completed on a timely manner? I mean, yeah. would that be a reasonable job? It is part of that. Okay, yeah. okay. But do you see what I'm trying to get at? I do, and there's an answer to this, because what you will see is the select board hasn't seen it, but they have done many financial policies that they will see. One of them is an audit policy. The second thing that this board has not had and will be see, receive, seen and receiving is our current auditors, Sullivan and Powers, and they will give us an engagement letter for three years, so you can always renew it. The other thing that this board will see is actually meet the auditors. Fred Duplicity's will come down and speak to the board, but we will, so there'll be an engagement letter, so it'll be ongoing, so you can do a renewal, and there'll be a policy that says, you know, that the select board will eventually adopt as one of their financial policies, for sure, that says, we will be audited every year. And once you um, get on a roll like that, then it's a lot easier. And 
And I think that someone did, I've been calling around to get past audits, and I think at some point they were back audited, but I still kind of need to figure out who was who, because Bethel had somebody for a couple of years, and they left, and they had someone new, so um, we have established a good rapport with the auditor, and um, we're gonna stick with them for a while, I think, yeah. which the, would be helpful. The, the process was that when, <coughs> for those three years, um, there was an, an effort to get an auditor, but the statewide municipal auditing market was basically, you know, there was a vacant, uh, what would you call it, a dead spot or a desert on that. We weren't able to secure, um, and I think, unfortunately, my recollection of it is that, that, um, that the ones that were available were not preferred. And it wasn't that those, that three year period wasn't audited. It wasn't audited efficiently in the time, timely manner that we could use that information for, for future budgets. I mean, it has been audited, but it came, you know, they did, I think when it finally got done, they did four years with the audits, right? Yeah, they did. Um, they did the current year plus the three back years. Uh, but that doesn't help you after you've already moved on for three years, right? Yeah, yeah Joe. What is the plan to get the money for back taxes and the water and sewer that's out of control? I mean, I can't believe that people got so far behind and nothing was done. Yeah, so we, three years ago, um, instituted a tax and delinquency um, collection policy. It was uh, enacted one year and um, so, and it did slip by us last year with the town, the previous town manager didn't follow through on the tax sale and um, basically we're one year behind, but we have that policy and our finance director is um, committed to moving forward with that. She's been um, issuing uh, late notices and uh, working toward it, taking action on every one of those accounts. So I can let her follow up a little bit more with the specifics right now. So um, when we came, so coming to birth to Bethel was a little different, you know, so we started doing water sewer once we saw, you know, obviously I was aware of your collection situation. So water sewer, we started looking at that and I found out that, um, that apparently in Bethel they weren't, you should be issued obviously of your original bill, then a late bill. Then there's actually a two-page bill that has a bunch of legal stuff about water being shut off and things like that. So we actually just put that notice out for the first time a couple months ago. So that will be our process. Is we it's will. Been, it's been part of our ordinance since it was published, and this is probably the first time we ever issued that. Right. As far as shutting off water. So what we will do is that we will, and that is going to happen. But what coming in and you having such high delinquency rate and people not seeing some of these notices. What we have been doing is, you know, handwriting notes on bills, talking to people, doing inserts, and getting a lot of people to call back and make an arrangement. But you're right, this spring we will shut water off. If yeah, we don't have a payment arrangement in place that hasn't been being yeah, followed, can. people's water yeah. can be shut off. Yeah, we can shut off. No, you can. Nicolaitis was building. He wanted the water shut off, and they wouldn't shut it off because it shut off four or five other businesses in town. Well, that will be something that we may discover. I we think may that find some out. of that is hyperbole as well. I, I'm not sure that it's that factual. There's a lot of um, rumors about what we can and cannot do, but we well, have we, shutoffs for every property. But that property. might happen. We might find some places that need to have shutoffs installed. Right. And so then that becomes part of the priority for the work of the water department to get those those taken care of. Same thing with taxes. But we don't, it doesn't have process. to, we just, it doesn't have to be the action, but we do need people to understand that if, if we've got this kind of delinquency, then we can't be providing those services. Mm. No, I understand that. Yeah. So far, by actually enforcing the policy that we have in place, and this is only over a short period of time of the last four or five months since Teresa's been here, we've had a very favorable outcome with uh, collecting right now. So, you know, I don't have the exact data, but I would say we're collecting at a 200% rate than we were. Um, so we are getting some of that back now, and we're going through the procedure right now. Obviously, we don't want to shut people's water off, and we don't want to do tax sales, but but right now what we are doing is we are following, it, following our policy, 
and, and the people that do owe money are getting notified and going through the proper channels. And what it does is it's bringing people to the table to address the issue that they have. And so far, correct me if I'm wrong, Therese, but I talk with Therese you know, all the time. So far, it's been very, very favorable on working through this. As she said several times that she knows that there's no way you can get money from people if they're not spend if they're not paying the money and she's willing to work with people to find a way for the money to come in and that and that comes with starting the conversation. I have a customer of mine at South Royalton who's with the water on the water thing. He has a delinquent list of everybody that hasn't paid their sewer and water or whatever. He was at the shop one day, I said, Where are you heading? He said, I'm going to put a note on somebody's door. They got 60 days to pay the bill or come down and make arrangements. Yeah, yeah that's what we're doing. Yeah. We're following the state statute that kind of outlines how you have to do it, and that's what we're following. Um, and she's been, she sent out, so it said you have to send out that uh, two pagers on pink paper. And you'd be amazed how well that works. We had a lot of people come in and, and make arrangements. Uh, we're also, I've got the water department looking for curb stops. So come springtime, he'll be looking for the rest of the curb stops. Well, I, I understand that. But, and, you know, but that's, I mean, things like that help. I think even when people see that there's somebody in their yard looking for a curb stop, that, that helps to, to kind of push the boat. But we're following the, we're following the, the procedure that's been put in place, um, through not only through this board, but through the state also. And, um, and when, when I talked about, you know, one of the things that we had identified as a board was, you know, putting an efficient uh, administration in place. You know, efficiencies, everybody usually thinks of cost, but it's also on the collection end, too. I mean, and you know, we were not efficiently collecting what was owed to the tenant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and it, and it is, you know, you know, we're, we're great. It's good to have Teresa, mm -hmm. and she's got a lot on her plate because when you when you spend a long period of time of not collecting, and someone gets way behind, it becomes challenging. So, you know, we are working through those case by case basis, and the goal is to to work with everybody and get everybody so that they're in a yeah. Uh, caught up in a safe manner. Um, but we are working through that. And we, it, it just, it's only been four or five months, but we've, um, we've really come a long way since then. So. And, and Teresa just recently contacted a lot of the mortgage holding banks too and let them know that, that the people that, that they're financing are, are not doing what they should. So there's been some, I think you've got some calls of people mm -hmm. that have, are potentially refinancing and things like that. Um, so these banks are aware of the issue also. Mm -hmm. Yep. Chris, I'd like to get back to somebody's numbers about the uh, line of credit we're going to have to refinance. Uh, we're going to end up with $1,298,220 approximately that we are going to have to refinance long term. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. So you said we have 58, about $58,000 left to pay towards uh, infrastructure repair from Irene. But I got something from. Just to this, we overspent fifty-seven thousand dollars. Sure. No, so that we, that that money there would be what that that's our town obligation. The town obligation. But I have a financial statement here, which says that the town share of the total budget is almost six million dollars. The town share that we had to spend because we didn't get full reimbursement, was $337,875. So have we not, has the town not paid a no. substantial amount? No, we've or paid. What? We've paid, and um, we're waiting for this number to come There's back still some for $146. Still I have to look over here, because I have to look at my all projects, minus the money There's, received, um, minus the three cents on the grand list, minus the money from the state. FEMA, so due from Bethel will be, we'll get to the bottom line, we're not there yet, but we will eventually get to the 57,425. But, um, so this was what they call, I was redoing their FEMA spreadsheet, so I redid it so that we could put it in Excel that I could work with, because it came as a PDF. So this 279, which is the town's share, you're right, I took all of the total project amount, minus this money that we've received so far, minus our three cents on the grand list that the state is gonna pay us, minus um, that same you know, 53 from the state, minus FEMA, and then there was an adjustment that I'm waiting for or that's coming out of this final project that should put us down to the 57. So you're right, our town share originally would be the 279 out of pocket, but what I should have explained is after this, 
then the state came out and said, oh, no, no, we'll make you a three cent town. So we would have been on the hook yeah. for the full 27, 279,000. Well, it wouldn't have been the three, the three, two, or the three yeah, you're right, sorry, I'm looking at, that's just a large project, you're right. We would yeah. have been on the hook for the whole 337 until the state of Vermont said, no, we'll only make you pay three cents on your grand list. So, so if my numbers are right, we would take the 337, subtract the 240, and be left with a right so around Lucian, that number. So Lucian, you so, are correct. Uh, where yeah. had the governor at the time not came out with the proposal, we, that's how much the town of Bethel would have been held responsible for out of that $6 million. Okay. But being that the governor had come through and said that nobody would be, we would be a three cent town, mm -hmm. so that would be the most that we'd be burdened as long as we adhered to the regulations and everything else. So I should have explained that earlier. Yeah. Sorry. And they're they're still I mean just like trying to get government money and you know it, it's slow, you know. They like to take it but they don't like to give it back to you fast and we still have money that's owed to us that we're we're still um, okay, collecting. So going back to that one point almost three million. We're only going to be liable for another fifty eight thousand approximately. Right. Then, then we go to the delinquent taxes and utility payments. That comes out to the latest figure I have is four hundred and sixty-seven thousand. Yep. So that's going to so that theoretically or maybe in fact came out of that one point two million, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's all part of the line. So that leaves a lot. That leaves even more money than I thought. That seems to be unaccounted for. Well, you might not have heard him because it's the acoustics in here are tough. There was he also is saying that he's subtracting from that about four hundred thousand dollars for that big flood event that we had or that you had in two thousand and seven. Right. And then he's saying the fifty seven, which right. comes up close to your numbers, which leaves an amount which he's saying he can't you know, we're not totally accounting for except for overspent budgets and the conversations right. you and I have had before. Right. Yes, the acoustics in here are not great, yeah, are they? Yeah, that was a little hard to follow. Okay. So that's yeah. the other number that he took off from there was that. Right. Um, so we have, what, about 400,000 that's not accounted for? Yeah, about yep. 370,000. Yeah, he came up, yeah. Okay. And, which, yeah. which if you, you know, if you go back and look at 10 years with the budgets, it's about 30, you know, $37,000 a year that was, you know, overspent. Now, I mean, that that doesn't necessarily mean it was, like Carl said, doesn't necessarily mean it was mismanaged. It could have been, you know, I know, what, two years ago, we all of a sudden had to put in that that new system up at the state garage, mm -hmm. probably up at the town garage, because the state passed a law saying that we had to do that. Some and, sort of and we only had, what, a couple months to do that. So that was $15,000 that we hadn't anticipated that we had to go and do. Um, so there, there are some of those. There was um, money coming and going out of, or maybe not coming and going, but there were several different locations for the money to be paid back that was being used to offset different expenditures with these different lines of credit. And I, and I know that the answers that I was getting were, made it clear that the, it was, un, they, there were too many moving pieces to, to get, <coughs> Clarity to where that money is. We weren't having the kind of internal auditing on a date on a year-to-year -year basis that Therese is desiring. So they weren't saying, "Oh, there's the thirty-seven thousand dollars from this year," that and they were bringing it to the front and, and highlighting it so that it could be deducted from a budget or included in some kind of a repayment. It was just um, somehow in the in the cloud. We were, we were told in the previous town management administration way back that the extra that we had to spend on that 2007 flood was getting paid off, I believe, at $50,000 a year. It was like $400,000 or so. And supposedly that was getting paid off. It was in the budget. Did that money not go towards paying that off? Well, that's what we're saying. It's kind of hard to follow all the different. We may have actually paid it off Several years, but um, you know there were times in which the highway department overspent the budget by a hundred thousand dollars or more. So um, you know it, it depends on. There was just if you add up the overpayments that you figured uh, just on the uh, uh, where are we at here on the public work side. Yeah. Excuse me, just a minute while I, yeah, the, the, the public works budget, 
from like 2005 through 2010 was overspent by 2,394,000. The only thing you have to be careful of with that sheet there, Lucian, is now, could there have been overspending? There absolutely could have been. But, but the other thing that that sheet there doesn't capture is if you, let's say, if you set your budget today for $100,000, right? And then we find out the day after town meeting that we get a grant to go to go fix a bridge that costs fifty thousand dollars, right? That's going to show up in your next year audit report, showing that you spent one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that that was overspent two million dollars. Now maybe that was overspent by three hundred and seventy thousand. You, you might be right there, um, but unless you kind of go back and look at did, did we get more revenue that year that was um, not anticipated to offset some of that? Um, it becomes tricky. I mean, I think one of the things that boils down to is there was, there was too many moving parts for the administration that was in place during this time to manage correctly or efficiently or however word we want to put it. You know, and, and that was the reason why we, you know, really pushed to have a Instead of going and getting an assistant town manager, we went to get a financial person um, of Therese so that we can make sure that this doesn't happen and, and that not only is our cost being looked at, but our revenues are being collected. Okay, well, with this, for instance, at this $467,780 at the moment of delinquent taxes and utilities, part of, it's going to be part of this $1.3 Refinancing. Yep. If we start to collect on this, I are we know. going to be able to credit that somehow maybe towards town yeah. expenses so we can maybe lower future expenditures and taxes? So correct me if I'm wrong, Therese, but so if we, if we collect, what I'm just throwing that, say we collected the whole thing, right? That would go into our undesignated balance <coughs> which right for now, the yeah. town, which then, then you could Yep. With permission from the select board, right? With permission from the voters. You, you could. So let's say, let's say magically we collect all this money in one year. So we could next year take that money because it, what happens is it gets put into an undesignated fund. Mm -hmm. We it's could take we could take that four hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars and apply it to the principal balance of the one point two. So then your balance is, you know. Eight hundred thousand. I mean, you can do that. There's no doubt. Yep. You can do so. But it doesn't. Things. But you can't. As you're getting it, you can't make like an extra loan payment. That's not the way it works. So you can't pay down. You can't like say, okay, well, we just spent fifty thousand dollars less on a highway project next year because we have fifty thousand dollars that we can spend because we collect the taxes. We actually need to keep our our budget segmented moving forward so that money is paid where we owe it. So we can um, get to a point where we are no longer carrying this deficit. So that then budget funding and expenditures are moving forward. So if you there's so you're not because otherwise you just artificially deflating the budget. Artificially what? Deflating. I mean, you're just yeah. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, because that's what we what we've been doing. We, no, um, the attitude has been, and I've heard it tonight that in, in previous budgets, we were overspending. And then the next year, we'd try to budget the same amount or a little bit more, but then we'd overspend again. And the attitude here is, well, we were never, we were never increasing the budget enough. How about the idea of, of scaling back expenditures and taxation somewhat and going in the opposite direction? Yeah, we're totally on board with that. The thing that you have to recognize is that that's, that's an ideal that we're all aiming toward. But we are not, and the administration has never been the reason why services have been provided beyond the scope. It's the people in the town who, who desire or demand services, and there are emergency expenditures that are required. So, um, you know, we have a road system we've put in place. We have state laws that require us to maintain them at third-class third standing. So you have an issue with a road, 
you have people who drive over that road who demand class three maintenance. So then you have to upgrade that road in a, in, in a particular April or a particular September. And those are the kinds of expenditures that we're talking about. This is not just people being liberal about the expenditures. This is, a, this, is a, this is the entire town has to understand that every time we come to the town meeting and look at a budget, they have to carry that sense of frugality forward throughout the year. They can't just keep hammering the town office with demands and then expect that somehow we haven't, we're not gonna overspend. So the town has for many years voted in what was considered to be a reasonable budget. But we've just shown you that over 10 years, even though the voters thought they were spending a legitimate amount of money, they were actually spending way more. So, you know, also, so Carl, the budgets that I mean, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but looking over the budget from previous years, the budget has always been increasing, three and a half, four percent, five percent, every year, way beyond inflation. And we spent even more than that. Well, then there's something wrong. Well, yes, that's and I'm saying that that has a lot to do with the people who are voting for it. So if I could, just to tag on to what you were saying, Lucian, is the two things. So I, I, you know, I won't speak for the board, but I, you know, from the conversations that we've had at the meetings, I think we're trying to do this in two ways. One, we understand that the, based on the services that the taxpayers have asked for or demanded, our our budgets haven't been as accurate as they could have been. No, I'm sorry, I thought they 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 haven't been accurate. So, however, at the same time, we believe that we were not being as efficient as we could have been with our money. So we're trying to take that balance between um, getting the right budget, which it's not going to be this year, and it's probably not going to be next year. We we're working on it. We're trying to get that good harmony between everything. But we're, we're starting to see that we're getting, you know, we're getting more bang for our buck, right? We're being more efficient with our money. And, and so that we can, you know, instead of just raising the taxes, maybe we can meet in the middle somewhere. We're, we're raising a little bit of taxes, but we're being more efficient to get those services that we desire. If you stay around, you may experience that because Greg has an issue he's bringing to us tonight about expenditures within the highway department that, that highlights the creativity and, and the discipline that he's brought to this position. We're going to be discussing ways to fund this emergency expenditure that we're facing. So um, in the past, it hasn't been that way. And um, you know, I, I think that as we're moving into this winter, we've heard, a, well, we're moving halfway through it, but we've heard a lot of um, discussion this winter about the, the delivery of particular services. And a lot of that has to do with our manager and our road foreman um, metering our expenditures and, and our provision of services. Because they're very much aware of what the budget actually says. And, they've, and we haven't just been throwing manpower and material at the situation um, because it's been demanded. So that's what I'm getting at. I don't, don't mean that it's actual individuals calling down, but there's a standard of expectation within the town that when there's snow on the road, it needs to be cleaned up. And it, it, it can't always be that way. Well, I, I've, I've heard of, uh, some of the things that have been done now with the road uh, budget and so forth, and I think it's really a good thing. And I also read in the paper about people complaining about the, the level of maintenance. But my understanding is that when a storm hits, the crew goes out there and just keeps plowing until it's all done. And if they go over eight hours, then that's what they go over. They get paid over time for that day. But they still, as far as I can understand, have the same level of maintenance and snow plowing as we had before. I'm sorry, Carl. I we're plowing, I think, probably somewhere about this day around, we're plowing twice where we used to plow three times. We're managing the overtime and we're managing the storms so that, that we're not actually just, like I say, going, throwing manpower and material at the roads. 
Well, so that's what I'm saying is that so some of this is not clear out front, but the truth of the matter is um, we've been managing our, our road crew much differently under this administration. Well, I think it's a really good thing. But, you know, again, I mean, you know, we didn't have a lot of forward thinking in this town for many years. It was all about balancing the budget based upon what what our pockets and we had a very you know sh nearsightedness in this town and we're going to see more challenges between everybody that we're going to have to get together to address that have not been um, planned for or looked at for years and you know not to scare you all but we have you know we have some water tower issues that we're going to have to rectify you know there there is a town garage there's yeah, right there's a town garage that's falling apart and there, there's a lot of things that were not done with forward thinking in the past and where we could have probably you know, it's going to cost us more money now to do it than if we would have been saving some money over a long period of time so it's a, we have, so, it's, a it's managing a bunch of different transecting lines but something that because of the the water delinquency has led to discussions about the cost of the water system and obviously not all the town taxpayers pay for this, only the people who use it, but it's a good example of the history of financial and capital planning in this town. In, there are a lot of expenditures to maintain something like a water system. Um, in 1949, the town decided that it was going to modernize and upgrade and, it would, and it, we voted as a town to take over what were three different private water systems. There were private water delivery systems in the town. And the town contracted with an engineering firm to evaluate those systems and to uh, project the cost of capital in, in investment to uh, upgrade the system to be a, a, a provide the kind of modernization that a water system would provide. There was a, a um, a recommendation for a, for a reservoir uh, above ground, a gravity feed. Uh, it was basically a built reservoir in a stream in a high elevation. There were uh, several sections of the private systems that were recommended to be rebuilt or to be replaced and, and with new systems. And uh, I think the other category was the, the cost based on, um, on a professional construction firm doing the installment. That was followed up by a select board report to the town recommending that we not build the reservoir, that we not replace the, old, the existing private water systems, and that we actually do the work with the road crew, the highway department at the time. So it saved a substantial amount of money right off the top, and it was attractive to the town, and the town voted it into place. But that's exactly the kind of process that our town has had for many, many years. And there's nothing wrong with making do with what you have, but when you put into, into place a system that 70 years later is still suffering the chronic abuse, basically, of neglect, because there's never been, no, they had an opportunity, we had an opportunity to get ahead of that system and to create a capital plan to maintain a highly functional delivery system of, of water to the municipality and we didn't do it and we still are there. And you look at our roads, you look at our town garage, you look at many, many examples in this town. We're not made of money and we're not talking about spending money but we're talking about recognizing where the expenses are, and how we today can make plans so that people in 40 years can see how we got from where we are now to where they are so that they understand those expenditures. Because really, I'd like to see them spending half of what we're spending instead of us spending twice of what somebody else could have spent. And I, and I know it can be done, but you have to plan it. And unfortunately, it's not just a band-aid we're taking off, it's a, it's a big cast. There's, a, there's an item in the budget, capital improvement reserve fund. It was special voted in 50,000 last year, it's in the budget this year. 
I would like to see this town run more like a business. Instead of creating a slush fund that we don't know how we're going to spend. If you think that the town garage, so it's, it's oh, I'm not, not done, slush, wait a minute. It's not a slush fund and we don't No, wait, space. I'm not done. If you so think, for instance, is. that the town yeah. garage, excuse me, it's my turn to talk. Yeah, if you think, for instance, Well, you it's don't. A capital you, improvement fund. It's a capital improvement fund, but for what and for how much? And as I was saying, I would like to see the town run more like a business, which would be if you want improvements in the garage, you get some money together to hire an architect and or engineers or somebody to come look at it, yeah. do a plan, figure out a plan with specs and drawings, yeah. they come back with that, yeah. then you bid that out, then you know exactly what it's going to cost to do what you want. And then you come to the taxpayers and ask for the money. This is going in the opposite direction. Well, we've, and Lucian and I have spoke about capital planning. And, um, you know, and what he's saying is, isn't inaccurate. I mean, that's how you come up with a capital plan, is you look at all your projects and you have, you know, planning studies or whatever the term may be. Um, to, to figure it out, to come up with the plan, which is something that you know hasn't been done yet. I, I refer to that as a capital building, but call it whatever you want. So that plan has to be developed, and it hasn't been developed yet. But Lucian is correct. Obviously, that's the way you you would develop a plan, and then you have the money, and you decide as you move forward what the need was and how much you needed to get from each place. And um, frankly, I haven't been here long enough to see if you've already done a study yeah, on what you need. Well, we have to have a plan, So what the capital improvement fund is for is it's that what we just talked about it's that forward thinking in the town. So what we're doing right now is we're putting aside money into the capital improvement fund for designated projects five years, ten years down the road, so that we don't have to go to the taxpayers and say we need a million dollar garage and we're going to bond it this year. And then I mean the idea is we want this really nice bell shaped curve to our to our, our taxes, right? We don't want the, you know, up, down, up, down. I mean, we want something that we can budget our lives around. And that's what this capital improvement plan is. And, and we have a, the capital improvement plan is published and it's, it's not detailed, but it has, it has some set projects in place that we, we, I'll say we, the town, would like to see or needs to be replaced in the next X amount of years. And those, those are things like, like um, the town garage and, and things like that. So rather than <clears throat> five years from now come and say that we need a million dollars to build a town garage, um, what we're doing is we're putting aside money now. So that, what we can do is when we want to start engineering it, we can start engineering it. We still have money in that fund. That fund is no different than the funds that we have for um, highway equipment funds or fire department um, equipment funds. It's no different than that. It's forward thinking. It's let's get ahead of things rather than come to the taxpayers down the road for a substantial amount of money. So maybe what we have to do is we put money into the fund and five years from now we come to the voters for $750,000 to, to bond rather than have to bond a million dollars. That, that, that's the thing behind that. I'll have to look and find mine. I'll email it to you. I have to find it. I haven't seen this one, I guess. So I'll look for it and then. Well, that's, I was going to say, you're going to need a bond eventually anyway, so. And we published portions this year. I guess I, we were looking at thinking it was something different. So I'll have to look and see what I have. And get a team machine. Yeah, and, and the truth of the matter is, we can't, we're not putting $50,000 aside that we can spend any way we want. Right. This is $50,000. It was to create, the main placeholder was to create a fund that was for capital improvements. And a 
associated with the capital improvement plan. And without that fund line item, we didn't have it, we don't have any money in that in that and we have no by creating that we've created some legitimacy to the capital planning process. Yes. Um, the um, taking care of this uh, line of credit, this amount of money we want to borrow to take care of previous deficits. Up to what year? Or what deficits are we talking to? Uh, what do they go to? Like last, the end of last year, two thousand seventeen. Well, I mean. The period of time that we went back as far was 2007. So everything from now back to 2007 is the, was the time frame that we went back to. Okay. Well, no, I guess I'm saying, um, yes, like, so for example, if I look, I, okay, if, if I look on page 33 and I look at the budget and then the actual amount spent up through June of 2017, there would appear to be some over expenditure. I mean, has the board identified whether we went over budget last year with last year's budget? <coughs> and is that being taken into account with the amount of money we're going to be borrowing to retire these deficits that are all over the place? Yep, it includes that. I just spoke to them last week to get the final number because, like I said, I hadn't seen the draft. But that was my question. What are we left with once we finance and move this um, payment, this line of credit, into a long-term debt? And what he said was it would be about $1.2 I don't have the exact number yet. But basically, we'd have no... We didn't become... It'd bring us to a zero balance as of June 30. We'd okay. have no surplus but no deficit. Okay, so then hopefully the idea is that at, at the end then of every subsequent year, you 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 have a handle of what your deficit was. If, if we overspent, we Absolutely. know what it right. is. And you should know during the year. Right, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, right. and you definitely, you, you should know, yeah, definitely. I, I, I don't want to be surprised by a deficit. I oh. should know going through the year, you can see if someone's off trend. That's the great thing now about having <coughs> department heads that are now coding their own bills and they're getting copies of these reports every month so they right, can see where they stand and if they have questions monthly, they can ask. And then obviously, report. you know, and it's something we discuss is if you have to overspend have one line, then how are you thinking about where you're going to underspend something else because the budget isn't a suggestion. This is where you need to end up at the end of the year. So it certainly has been an education process just within the town, um, but no. Okay. So at my, so we'll, we should be right on June thirtieth. You're going to come to a zero balance as of June 30, twenty seventeen, and then this year we're uh, keeping an eye on. Yeah. Here we go. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So the board is getting we're getting monthly or, or at least monthly. Um, progress reports now so that we're able to review that deficit and more um, or surplus so to speak but yeah. basically we're awesome. we're skimming you know the manager it's tight the management is working to make sure that we're under budget but we had you know we had a system that you know even your department heads didn't know what their budget was right I mean so it's kind of hard to manage your your department if you really don't know what your budget is, right? I mean, if you have one person kind of controlling that whole budget rather than, you know, if you have six department heads, then that should be up to the department heads to manage. And then, and then you, you know, and then you talk to, you know, so the water department should be talking to, to Greg or, or the, you know what I mean? So we're, uh, since we started doing, or since Therese and Greg have started actually giving the department heads their budgets. I mean, we're, we're seeing ownership. There's an ownership into it. There's a, you know, if they have to go and buy, oh, tire is blue on the truck, and they have to go buy a tire, they, you know, they come in the office to code the tire, right, to the right line item, and then they're thinking, you know, and these guys now are thinking, okay, we just spent $2,000 on a tire. Where can we make $2,000 up to try and balance this thing? And, the, and those conversations are actually happening right now. I don't want to, I wasn't in the office before, but I'm willing it probably said something like this. We had to spend $2,000 on a tire. 
Let's go get another bundle right? of great steaks. Then, then the budget's off by $2,000, right? And I think that there was no ownership. In that. And one other, uh, not a question, but a comment. So I, I noticed, I, I read in the report about the, the rationale behind the request for the $5,500 for the two hydrant replacements and the $10,000 for maintenance at the fire department. And I, it's more of a comment. It just seems like those are things that we, we need to spend, we need to do this. We need to upgrade those hydrants and it sounds like there's a plan to do two a year and we'll keep doing two a year. And, and there is maintenance that's required at the fire department or things are gonna get really, they're gonna get worse, not better. So it seems like those expenditures should actually be not a request to the taxpayers, should we fund this, but more of a statement from the board um, and from the management that we need to spend this money. So I, I guess I'm just well, trying to ask the rationale behind putting it up for a, a vote to the, the public. Hopefully the it's for reasons for doing it would be apparent. But it's for education and discussion. This is not, these are not what we're considering to be frivolous expenditures. We are, showing the 3% increase on the bare bones budget. We have offered these other items because we know their expenditures, we believe that they're important, but people have to understand what it costs to run this town. And we need to have these discussions. It's just like the, the human services items. So um, I, it is, has been our decision on this board that rather than lumping these things into the line items in the budget, we've had opposite responses. People saying, you're just hiding these expenditures in the budget and nobody knows about them. So um, it's a town meeting, it's a democratic process, it's our largest gathering in the town of people who are scrutinizing the expenditures of the town. It's an opportunity to have this discussion from the floor. So um, it's mostly a, a democratic process. But it also, I think, from a budgetary standpoint, Chris has said it already, it gives us an opportunity to show you our um, adherence to the bottom line on, a, on an absolute base, basis of a functioning budget. Yes? Um, my name is Cynthia Lunici, and we're uh, kind of new property owners, and I just wanted to commend you guys because the difference, you know, we're sort of new to Vermont, new to the town hall, you know, town meeting process and the open select board meetings. So I see a big difference from a couple of years back in just the responsiveness and some of these details coming out more. I know it's going to be really painful. It's probably even be more painful going forward with some of the challenges I think everyone's going to face. But I feel more, let's say, confident in the direction the town is taking because I think people are stepping up, it appears to me, to take responsibility for some of these issues. So I just want to thank you. So that's Great, it. thank you. So we are about 20 minutes over the 715 cutoff line. I, I, don't, I think it's an important thing. It's a great opportunity to have this many people here and to have the questions that you've asked. But um, if if there are a few more questions, we'd take them. Otherwise, we'll move on with the rest of our meeting. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Take five. Take, take a break for five minutes. If you guys want to hear what we're saying, we're going to have to stop talking. So we've, we've got... Part of the way through the town manager's report, um, we got all of your staff report, basically the high points were already covered. We had a constable's report, was in the packet. I got a chance to see firsthand today the creation of the constable's report, so it's a pretty interesting high-tech tool that he's using to craft these. Yeah, that seems to be changing as they go. We're learning a lot. Yeah. As he said, there's, oh, Mark, are you still here? There are, what, two more towns, two or three more towns that are in it now? Yeah, there's three more towns on it, so it's being, I shouldn't say, it's being modified as we go along with new ideas. Uh, stuff that we need, certain requests, a lot of stuff you guys can see, that Greg can see it, but 
we have access to different type of reports. Reports that I have to file every year, of course. And the traffic stops now. It's, it's part of the program, so it's getting high tech. Yeah. Uh, well worth the dollar, that's for sure. Yeah. Good. Well, they're good thorough reports. Sure. Um, so then that leads us to minutes and communications. We have the select board minutes from February 12th, regular meeting to approve. Hmm? I didn't get a copy of those. You didn't get a copy? No. I got two of the rectifier ones. Well, uh, <laughs> we got a good, uh, we got a good letter. From, all right. So, well, I didn't see anything. Did anybody else get the? You got yeah, minutes? Yeah. yeah. I move we accept them as written. All right. So, uh, two small. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear the second. <laughs> oh, okay. I got a, a vote on the protest because I don't have an answer. Second it. Second it. All right. Vote. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Now they've been accepted. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, other communications, we got um, in other committee minutes, we got a letter of recommendation for Mark. We got a letter of resignation, right, from um, Brad. Brad. So he sounds like he's moving to the DRB if we get a letter of interest from him. Um, And that basically moves us into other business. Mo, you want to start? Yeah. Uh, we uh, saw the police that went through last week. Uh, and I found that when there's less town politics involved, things get done down there. Uh, so I would like to suggest that if we, we look at down the road that there wouldn't be a select board member on the board, be it all people that we choose out of the public. From both towns. From both towns. And South Walton would, uh, Ralton would choose theirs. Uh, we discussed stuff that, there was one lady there from Ralton that she hadn't spoken in two years and she was asking questions. Yeah. You know, so I mean, th there must be some kind of intimidation maybe, mm -hmm. what I'm thinking. It seems like a, I mean, it seems like it doesn't. I mean, if the changes move forward that we've been talking about, um, I think part of the reason for having this this select board member on the committees now has been because this this is still very much just a um, well, it's a subsidiary of the town. Right. So if. Yeah. I understand that, but I'm saying that when we move forward, I think it would be a good idea to just yeah. have it three members at large. Yeah. And I served for two years, and it's time for somebody else to serve, take my place. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I wasn't a select board member, I would be willing to serve. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> but we have got, so, so that leads by our next meeting, we've got to find two people to fill that position. Yeah. Because Jen Bartleman is. Yeah. Last our last meeting, she said that was her last meeting. Yeah, so the first meeting after town at the town meeting, we'll need to at least uh, get one person. So we'll have to put an ad out for that, or I'm just yeah, we got, the, we got that letter from Jen, right? Yeah, a couple we months ago, yeah. Or something, right? yeah, so we do need to find a replacement for that position. Have you got any solid any yes. response about the listers? Uh, I think there are a couple of people that, that love Luisa. Louise. Yeah, Luisa has got a, an idea. Of some she, she asked me about one of them. Yeah. I'll, I'll put a bug in there. Yeah. Other than that, we haven't gotten any feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to advertise for the, uh, the joint board. You know, one open position. Well, yeah. we have we had a representative, Jan Barlowman, who. That's, so we have two opens for in Bethel. 
Well, we, we, have, we have a select board member who, who feels it should, should be right. another person's job to do, so and then we also have a citizen. Right. So we've got two openings that we can. Yeah. Okay. We'll do it after, you want to wait and do it after the town meeting? Well, um, yeah, we typically appoint or reappoint positions after, after town meeting. Right. So we yeah. But their, meet, the, their next meeting is two nights after the board's next meeting. So the sooner you advertise for a position, we, we just need one citizen yeah. Yeah. for the for the solid waste advisory board, okay. and then one of us will be appointed based on the current. Right. Yeah, yes. Current I just did FYI. I brought that idea up during my discussions with uh, Sandy. Sandy. That didn't go over very good, did it? It didn't go over very well. Well, that's part of Mo's point. Yes. Yeah. Intimidation. <laughs> you know, so just intimidation. Keep that, keep that on your mind when you're reviewing these documents. The only, the only thing is, is, you know, and I mean, unless Royalton went into it with the same mindset of it would just be town's people and not anybody from the select board, I mean, you're almost... If they're going to keep a select board member oh, on it, yeah. then yeah. we probably want to keep a select board we'll member on it until right. that happens. Right. Down the road. We I mean, can come up with a you know, just Therese like, was there. Uh, I mean, the, the, the people were asking her questions that uh, some nights she wouldn't, she'd have got her head chewed off. <laughs> yeah, but basically, the, the bottom line is that moving forward, it, it should be a topic for conversation. We yes. should figure out what the pros and cons are of that and see what. what, what the, the current document doesn't stipulate that any board members have to Nope. No. No, it doesn't, no, doesn't what say that no board members can be on there. Right. So it doesn't, it just leaves it open that it's just a board comprised of three members from the town. Mm -hmm. and, and the perfect candidate be, would be somebody in the business sector. So, you mean, because when we get going on, on the new proposals, you know, it, it's going to be a business down there. Yeah. No, you're mm -hmm. right. Well, I appreciate that. Well, it's good to have that feedback. Um, Let's move to you, Chris, and your other business. Items. Oh, <laughs> well, I would just, as probably all of us had read, um, front page of the, the Herald was talking about Randolph and, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if they go through with it or not, but they were considering the, the option of opting out of the White River Valley Ambulance. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on in Randolph right now. Um, so I don't know how much traction this will have or not have. Um, and, but just wanted to throw that out there as maybe, you know, between now and at least through town meeting, um, something for us to think of if, if um, Randolph does opt out of, of White River Valley Ambulance, then it wouldn't affect us immediately because um, our budget would be set for this coming year, but it would affect us for the next budgeting session, which, um, you know, what worries me the most is if Randolph did opt out, we're, we're the second largest town, so we would then be the, number, the first largest town, mm -hmm. and we would be picking up the larger percentage of the money due, yeah. and I know in the past, um, the, the town has done some studies in regards to our own, having our own ambulance services. And based upon the amount of money that we pay currently, which is what, 127000 it, it makes more sense for us to be in the alliance right now. However, I don't know. I mean, if Randolph leaves, there's $300,000 that someone's going to pay for. And if ours goes up by X amount, maybe it is smarter for us to have it. I don't know. But all I was just going to say is maybe we should probably right now should just put it on the radar. Yeah. Um, let's see how town meeting goes. If, you know, because they vote theirs in just like we vote ours. And uh, if, if nothing happens, then I, I think we're good right now because you know, we've done the studies in the past to show that um, our best bang for a buck is being in the alliance. But if, if they do opt out, I think at that point, we probably want to put together some sort of, I don't want to use the word committee, but we should put together some sort of study <clears throat> and, and figure out what, what that would mean for the town of Bethel because mm -hmm. Well, we do have a town rep, and it might be good to prep him to maybe he'll know. Because I think there was another sure. town that dropped out too. Was it? Or or field? Field. Something else had dropped out. Be because they were close to last year, right? Williamsdale. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. one of the things that 
I guess is on the table is um, transport, and that's a huge fund. You know, so not not just yeah. picking up the funding from the other towns, but yeah. potentially losing revenue. Well, I don't want to say that that's how they make you know their money because yes. they're a nonprofit, but they. Um, no, that's a big part. Yeah. But if they did pick up the transport end of things, there would probably be a bigger percentage coming our way to begin with. That's the other thing is, <clears throat> that has been thrown out there is that it sounds like that what Randolph's trying to do is get get the alliance members to pay a bigger share. Is is what I'm yeah. kind of reading through the lines here. Just like every other. The other thing that I think that we have to figure out is we pay uh, we pay our current share usage in the formula but and we need to look at this but i think we pay even more than that because the facility sits on bethel land and if it's a non-profit i'm willing to say that they're probably not paying any type of taxation towards that so in a sense we're probably paying a larger share to begin with being that where, where they reside uh, just something to think of if we have to get into that yeah. you know who's paying what for the mm -hmm. services but i mean i i don't I, normally i would say this is probably something that goes away but it seems like there's a lot of things going on in randolph between suing the state and everything else so I, I, you know i would say as a you know if they did pull out the sizable increase that we'd see you know you know would be several pennies on the tax rate so something maybe, I, I don't know who the right people are in, inside our town to maybe start putting together another well, I know study somebody, on how much it might be if it came down to it. Some but, of the people on the fire department have been involved with yeah. in these discussions for a long time. And, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it doesn't, but I mean, I know in the past it, it's uh, more benefit for us to be in the alliance, but... Um, Good to be able to be thinking about where the next big bump in expenditures is coming from. Yeah. All right, so speaking of which. I move we go into the last Oh, no. We have to oh, oh, that's right. Town manager about the tires. Well, I got the first thing is I was just handed this uh, oh, yeah. a minute ago. Yeah. Uh, this is an application from uh, Verizon Wireless for a new telecommunications facility up on Deering Road. Um, by state law, they're required to uh, give us advance notice before they file their, their actual application. Uh, this is just their advance notice, um, putting us on alert that, that they're proposing this. Um, what we've done in the past with this is we've waited till they've done the actual application, and then we review it or have our, our engineers review it and, and provide any comments that we might have. But this is more just kind of an FYI that, yeah. that they're, they're proposing this, and um, looks like it's going to be a pretty big tower out on on Deering Road. So when I get the actual application, I will bring that to you and we will. That's probably right at the town line then, huh? Well, I'd imagine it'd be up on Baldy, what I call Baldy, you know, up behind the, the uh, Wakefield place. Yeah. Cause, you know, because that was all but over. Is that, I mean, the town line's got to go right through there. Pretty right? close, yeah. pretty close. Yeah. yeah, I can't tell from this, but, but when the application comes out, the actual application will, we'll take a look at it and see if we have any, any comments or any issues with it. Submit those. Okay, so. good. Yeah. It, is, it is in my mind. <laughs> there is a road that goes down and eventually comes to the Marsh Road. Yeah. Okay. Used to be, up by you. Yeah, it used to be the Marsh Road all the way to Mark Smith. <laughs> all right. So uh, I sent an email out uh, today, early uh, this morning, uh, about a need that we that has arisen over the last few days. We've Alan's known about it for quite a while and been telling me about it, but we've got uh, trucks that have the knee tires badly, really bad. Um, the one ton had uh, recaps on it, and Alan came to me on Friday and said, hey, take a look at these. They're bubbling up, there's tread off, you know, just falling off of them. And I said, well, can you limp through, you know, can you limp through until we can figure out how to get some money to get them? Well, Saturday, two of them, two of them popped. Yeah, popped on it. One blew, limped it back off the bridge, you know, and overnight it's sitting in the garage, the other blew because it actually had the ball. I thought it was the one that popped. Yeah, it was on the sidewall. Um, so, so I went out Saturday and, and took a, a 
Tires are. Um, uh, I inherited since I got here, um, and one set was uh, set of recaps on, on the on, on the, the on one of them. But yeah, yeah. And, starting, uh, and he's and he's been running recaps on the one ton also. Yeah, he's so, exactly. So I feel like we're kind of throwing good money after bad here. Yep. But so what I propose is I, I talked to Alan and we went through um, how much it's going to cost to just kind of get him ready to go for the rest of this year. Um, the, the one ton would need all new tires, fronts and backs and all that, so that's six tires. Uh, and then the other dump trucks, we, we figured 10 tires total, right? We had eight rear tires and two fronts, two steers. Yeah. Um, so uh, Alan went and got three different bids, uh, should be included in there. There's, there was three different bids in there from three different companies. And Rouse seemed to be the best one, and they will actually come down and they will mount them here. They come to us instead of us taking them off and having to go get them. So we know what we need. We haven't got the money right now in our budget. We've, we've had equipment breakdowns and things like that. So I, I, instead of continuing to spend and going over our budget, what I was proposing, I was looking at the capital plan, uh, Teresa, we're looking in, and a couple of things came up that maybe we just shift some of those monies around and purchase these tires, which is a, you know, it is a capital expense. So purchase these tires, at least part of them, out of this, this current budget that we have. Um, so a couple of things here on your list. The, the first thing we found was that next year, there was actually a payment all shown on here for the, the F550, which is, it is not there. Uh, this truck will get paid off in March, I believe. So that's actually $18,000 that we actually had projected to spend next year that we don't have to. So it was a one extra payment? Yeah, so we've made that adjustment. It's, in the, it's not in the budget, but it's in the... Right, it's, it's, it's in, in this in the schedule. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so that, that kind of, you know, started kind of looking about, well, what can we do here? The other thing I noticed was that in uh, 2022, they have a replacement for the grade. I think that's way too soon. Uh, I've talked to Alan, and I've talked to others, and I've typically seen these, these especially graders, that don't get nearly as much use, and they're not kind of beat up like well, some of the other equipment. Yeah, um, usually 20 to 20, uh, till 20 to 25 years for a replacement schedule on something like that. We had so, them old Austins for 35 well, years. Well, the main thing, though, is to keep alert because that the point was there's a sweet spot where you end up trying to drag out a piece of equipment that's, number one, costing you time because you're not making, you're not using it if it's, if it's needing repair or right. Sure, sure. So that's, that's the reason why I think that this was sort of like a sort of the best possible time frame okay. to repay, repair it. Then you've got you got a brand new piece of equipment, and it's but so I, I have no problem yeah. with the idea of extending. I, this. I think with the way we maintain them on a daily basis now, the grease, their oil that is, is being done, it, it's not unreasonable at all to think that thing can last twenty years. I, I really don't think that's unreasonable. With you know, we have to get a mold board, we have to get some tires, but things the like reason, that. But at the basis. Another five years. Yes. At least. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So anyway, um, so what I just gave you is, is kind of a hand scribbled idea of what the implication would be of, of buying those tires. So uh, to buy all the tires, to buy all of the tires, we're looking at it would have been 16 tires plus some fronts and all that. We were looking at about 10,000 bucks. Uh, Alan thinks you know we'll just get away with with just buying the 10 for the dump trucks and then the six for the one ton, and that came up to 5,500 uh, dollars. That's Rouse coming here doing all the work and you know, coming to us and doing all the work. Um, so what I just wanted to show you was, was what that would be, kind of what that, what that implication would be on the capital plan, the long-term capital plan, and how that would shake out. Um, I've also got some other ideas for another piece of equipment that we might be able to, to use, utilize also here. But for the meantime, what I'm asking for is, is to uh, see if the board would, would approve the expenditure of $5,500 out of the capital, the, the trust fund, Highway equipment trust fund. I believe that's what the accounts by are. shifting by the shifting the cost of the, of the of the greater five years. Before. Well, and actually, and then uh, and lim eliminating that uh, that extra payment. Okay. There was an eighteen thousand dollar payment All that was not there. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to do something because the, there's two things here. I mean, we don't want a loaded truck going down the road and blow 
one side and cause a, a serious problem somewhere, and uh, we don't want trucks down. So, but I think being creative like this yes. makes a lot yeah. of sense, and, and I don't think it's unreasonable. It's not just, a, oh, here's $5,000, we can move this out of the way. I think that this it has some legitimacy, clearly. One question I've got. Are you running corked up chains, pretty good corked up chains? Yes, sir. Yeah, that, that's going to hurt your tire life tremendously because they're running on pavement with a full load. And I've actually talked to the guys, and we're trying to cut back on the chain use. Since I've got here, they've got really, um, I've ran these roads, the back roads, and some of these hills like Macintosh and whatnot, um, just sliding backwards with a full load on you, it's, it's pretty gnarly. Um, so there, therefore, it becomes a safety issue as well. So I, I'm not against using the chains, but at the same time, I'm telling the guys, really take the time. I mean, if we have to take an extra hour out of our day to take them off or put them on, using your, their judgment, then do so. Um, the corked up chains are gonna just tear your treads apart tremendously on, when you're running them on pavement. You know, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's like a skidder. Their tires are always bald. The only reason is because of the change they get on that. Just eats them. Eats them. And, you know, and that's part of the problem with these recaps that I bought. Right. Is it just, yeah, you don't Yeah, we just, you know, we got a month out of it. We got a that's month out of it. I have a question. So is there some other type of chain that you can run that's... Well, yeah, we've always run just a straight cross link. Yeah, what he's oh. talking about is they've got, they've got spikes. an extra half inch of spikes floating on so that if you're lifting the tire or it's cutting into the, into the rubber on the bottom. Pitch it. As, as, as yeah. a waste of money. Makes, I understand tire. I mean, I'm a Vermonter. I know tire chains. But I'm just curious tough. about this. So, but do you really want those running on your paved roads? Well, that's, that's, that's my point. That's what I'm going to say. I'm saying because so you're too. breaking I mean, down your tires and your roads at the same I don't have time. Oh, I got you. How many ton you get on your body, but you're, you know, you're forcing a lot of that right into pavement. So oh, okay. okay. I've never heard that expression before, so I was just curious. I was curious about the difference of chains. I well, so I mean, it's one thing to have them on when you're running over dirt or, course, or yeah. frozen ground, but when you come off of that pavement, he's talking about taking the time, stopping. You know, Morgan runs one on his front tire, and he, every time he comes off the road, he stops and takes it off. Exactly. So. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that there were different kinds of tires. Well, there's different, yeah. there's different kinds of cross lines. There's different kinds of cross lines. I mean, there's a straight old. But I mean, you don't have to. I mean, those are great chains. And we and you can run, but it, it and it doesn't take that long to stop and take them off. Right, exactly. So rather right. than running back, or it's actually running out with a full load with the chains right, on exactly. already. So was this more of a uh, the method in which we are going about using our trucks, or is this go back to some of the well? I think deferred we're, maintenance things that I, we've I seen in the past. Deferred maintenance. It's we were using the cheapest thing we could get our hands on. So right. Because we're over budget. Because we're over budget, so we're using recap tires that last one month that are, I don't know, what two thirds the cost of a regular tire. I don't know how much. A third maybe. So you know, on do you buy three of those or do you buy one good one and go about your day? Plus the downtime. Plus the downtime. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we had to actually. So Saturday, Sunday morning, we had to call Dylan in because we so had a one ton that's sitting there with two flat tires. We couldn't get tires. We called around. He called all over the place mm -hmm. trying to get tires, and nobody has them. Nobody has them. Uh, we can't get them until this week sometime. So, well, I appreciate the creativity. I think this is exactly what we're looking for. Well, it sounds like you're so happy. Look at the next day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he did. Oh, okay, <laughs> <it's up. laughs> with the red writing on it. That's the one that. Just something to think about for the future. We're to, kind of kind of using the same concept to uh, um, yeah, right. aid in buying some equipment that we I think we really really need. But that's going to have to wait until we see what happens with town meeting. Yeah, anyway, so today I just um, I just need you to um, if, if the board is okay with this, just to approve this this expenditure of fifty five hundred dollars out of this um, this account of the highway trust fund. So move. Second. Yeah. All in favor. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Well, I think it's great to have the scrutiny.
And you know, in this way, this is the part of, of the capital planning. So we have the projected costs laid out, so you have the opportunity to look at that and scrutinize it, and then you put it in there and you change those numbers and you project it forward so everybody down the line sees what the decision was and how it, how it plays out. And yeah, that's exactly the whole point. Well, one of the points. <laughs> I think that's everything I have. All right. Um, I move we go into executive session on uh, legal matters. Okay. Anybody want to second that? Second that? No? All in favor? I don't know. Right. I stand so we won't be making any decisions.